I got to think about that. It threw me off just initially. He didn't tell them to throw out the whole pot. He told them to bring meal. What meal is, is essentially finely ground flour. And that's what it took to heal this pot of pottage. That's all it took. It says, and he cast it into the pot. It doesn't say he threw it beside the pot. He cast it into the pot. It's amazing when you think about the Word of God, it talks about the Word of God being likened to bread, flour, is one part of the Word of God. It's amazing when you really think about it. But it was after that they had put the meal into the pot that there was no harm found in the pot. Just think about that. Notice that it didn't take anything extremely special. He didn't go through and pray over it. He didn't put his hands over it to try to bless it. They just threw meal in the pot. I couldn't find anything extremely special when it came to meal or flour where it had any healing type properties. I, I didn't see that. I wasn't able to find anything that suggested that. But it was only after the meal was put into the pottage that it was safe for all of the people to eat. Next we're going to look at the first fruits given. Let's start reading in verse number 42. It says, And there came a man from Belshalisha and brought the man of God bread of the first fruits. Twenty loaves of barley and full of ears of corn in the husk thereof. And he said, Give it to the people that they may eat. And his servitor said, What should I should I set this before an hundred men? He said again, Give the people that they may eat, for thus saith the Lord, they shall eat and shall leave thereof. Verse forty four. So he said it before them, and they did eat, and left it, left thereof according to the word of the Lord. Here we have a man that's mentioned. It doesn't actually give his name. I didn't realize that till I was actually reading later on, just the exact context. It just tells the location where he was from. It says, and there was there came a man from Belshalisha. I was trying to find it. I believe it was Belshalisha. I, I can't remember where I, well, they said it was right off the top of my head now. But what I do know was significant is it says, you have this man, he's given what I believe to be his tithes, or also known as his first fruits. We can read in Exodus chapter 23, verse 19. It says, The first of the first fruits of thy land thou shalt bring into the house of the Lord thy God. This is nowadays for the church, we bring our tithes, or the tenth, to the church, to the storehouses. That's the way we do it here today. But we see this man, he. I can't see for certain that this was the house of God, but we do know that you have the man of God. And looking at the previous part that we covered, we can see that they were the sons of the prophets, that they was there. So I'm assuming it has something to do with that. But he brought what I believe to be his first fruits or his tithes. He took it directly to the man of God. I did look up the meaning for uh, Belshalisha. It, uh, it actually means Lord, or it also means the master of three things. But like I said before, this is the only time that we even see a reference to this man of God throughout the scriptures. I believe it's roughly 3,000 years ago that this man was mentioned. and You may not hear much about him, but he's still mentioned even today. Like I said, right now we're just barely talking about him, how he was willing to do the things that he knew that he should they was told repeatedly throughout the Word of God that they were supposed to bring their first fruits into the house of God. We saw right here that he takes them to the man of God. In verse 42, the, basically the second sentence says, And he brought the man of God bread of the first fruits. Tells us what it is. It says, Twenty loaves of barley and full ears of corn in the husks. Then you have, it says, And he said, this is the prophet speaking, Give it to the people that they may eat. I believe this was, like I said before, I believe this was the sons of the prophets. Then we can read in verse 43, it says, And his servitor said, What, should I set this before a hundred men? Just think about the God we serve. He is so great. It doesn't take much for God to be able to do a whole lot with just a little bit. We can think about how the Lord Jesus Christ, he fed these thousands of men with just a couple fish and a couple loaves of bread. We shouldn't put limits on God. God can do so much, even with so little that we have, if we're just willing to give what we've got. We've just got to be willing, to be a willing vessel. We see that he was willing to, 
he gave the bread of his first fruits, the twenty loaves, the ears of corn, and they was able to feed all these people. What gets better is the servant he pointed out that essentially that there was a hundred men. But knowing the God we serve, even if there was two hundred or three hundred, God has the power and ability to be able to feed all these people, even no matter how many that there were. Even though, yes, they was going through a hard time, they was going through a famine of sorts. They were struggling, they was having problems at this time. Next we're going to look at point number 21. It says that we can see the fleeting leprosy. This is in chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. It's about Naaman. It says, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man, with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captives or captive out of the land of Israel, a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Verse 4, And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, and six thousand pieces of gold, and ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now, when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. Verse 7, And it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive, that this man doth send me, send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. And it was so when Elisha the man of God had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will, will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Parfar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather then when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean? Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, and according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. I know that was a lot of reading real quick, but this passage, it, it amazes me almost every time that I read it. You have the captain of a Syrian king who has gotten this plague of leprosy. At this point in time, there had been no cure of leprosy. If memory serves, I believe he's the first man in the Bible that's ever healed of leprosy, if I'm not mistaken. But you have the, I believe it's the wife of Naaman that she's talking to somebody saying that there's a prophet of God in Samaria that could heal this captain. After that, the king finds out and he sends a letter to the king of Israel to try to find out basically this man of God if he can heal him of this leprosy. In verse number five, we can see how he sends him with silver. I believe it was 10 pieces of silver. Talk about gold says 6,000 pieces of gold. He would have been an extremely wealthy man to have all of this. And then it says, and 10 changes of garments in the end of verse number 5. We can see he went to make a request on behalf of Naaman to have him heal the leprosy of this man. We got to see in verse number 7 how you have this king, he gets the message that you have this man that's wanting to be healed of this leprosy and he rips his clothes. Usually when people rip their clothes, it's a sign of extreme grief or a sign of mourning, especially throughout the scriptures. It says he 
rent his clothes. In the middle of verse 7 says, And said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. I'm assuming that he's probably under the impression that they're trying to start a war between them. That there's going to be some great fight because you have this man that's coming up to him. He's wanting to be healed of leprosy. And he's wanting to go to the right person. He's trying to go to the man of God. He knew where he was at. It says he was in Samaria. Then you have in verse number 8, the man of God, Elisha, he somehow finds out and he, that the king had ripped his clothes. And he begins asking some questions, wondering, why did he rip his clothes? Just Then when it turns out, he's basically going to the king, basically having Naaman come to him to prove that there was a prophet in Israel. And it's proved over and over again throughout the scriptures. In verse number 9, you have Naaman, he goes to the house of Elisha. But what's amazing about this verse is, he comes, it says, verse number 9, so Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot. He probably wasn't alone whenever he went there. Having the chariot and all these horses, he probably had somebody with him. But it talked how he stood at the door of the house of Elisha. But what gets interesting is right after he gets to the door, Elisha, he doesn't even go out to talk to this man. What he does, he just sends a messenger out to him. Verse number 10 says, And Elisha sent a messenger unto him. Notice it doesn't even say who this messenger is. But if you was to go back through the Word of God, you might be able to deduce that it was probably Gehazi. Because over and over again it refers him to being the servant of Elisha over and over again. But he goes and talks to him. Like I said, it doesn't clearly give his name, but it always refers to him as a servant or the servant of Elisha. And he gives him the message that he was given. It says, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. We can see a promise here given. But it wasn't like the man of God. He probably could have put his hands over this plague of leprosy and be able to heal this man if he chose to. He probably could have. But I can't help but wonder if he was wanting Naaman to actually do something to be able to earn it, to prove his faith, prove that he believed in God enough to be able to do something. I can't help but wonder that. But after he sends the servant, the messenger, he tells him exactly what to do to dip in this certain place seven times. What always gets interesting is in verse 11, the way Naaman reacts, he, he reacts and says he was wroth or he was extremely angry. I imagine that whenever he had left, he was just storming off, stomping his feet. He was probably so angry. I bet he was just steaming. He must have had some expectation of the prophet that didn't happen. Like I said, I imagine that he was probably wanting him to have God or had Elisha call on God to touch this man, to heal this man. We can read in verse 11, about halfway, says, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of, his, of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Then he begins to try to make suggestions of what places might be better than the Jordan River. It says in verse 12, it says, Are not Abana and Parfar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel. Then it says, May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Couldn't help but notice that even though those rivers, they might have been better. He could have went to those rivers and dipped himself seven times, but I'm under the impression that if he would have, he'd have never been healed because he wouldn't have done what the man of God told him to do. He was told to go to a very specific place to be able to be healed. Damascus. He thought there was better places. But we can read a little bit further. It says, then, wait, make sure I'm reading the right one. Verse number 13, we can see the servant, how he had came near to talk to him. It says, and he said, my father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather than when he saith to thee, wash and be clean. Verse number 14, then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the man of God, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again 
like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. It's interesting whenever reading through the Word of God how you, get, you glean so much, even the smallest details are they're so important, how it wasn't until the servant had came to him and reasoned with him, telling him, basically it's like, if he told you to do some great deed, if he told you to do like three backflips and two jumping jacks or whatever, if he told him to do anything, make some sacrifice, he probably would have done that without a second thought. But he was told to basically go wash up, go get clean, go take a bath. Not necessarily because he was dirty or filthy, but because, yes, he had this plague of leprosy. But after that, he, after the servant had reasoned with him, he finally actually done what he was told to do in the first place. Verse 14 says, And then he went down. It wasn't until the servant had spoken to him that he went down and done what he was told to do. He dipped himself, or he washed himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. But what's amazing is, after reading that, how he had went, he washed, he'd done exactly as the prophet had told him. Look at just what, it, what happened to his flesh. It says, and his flesh came again like unto, his, like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. I can't help but imagine, whenever I've done a little study on leprosy, how you look at people, how they almost look like zombies, the way they have these shows portrayed. That, that's kind of what I imagine, how his flesh, flesh is decaying, how it's eating itself, the, the sin's eating him from the outside in, in this case. But it talked about how his flesh, how that it was healed in such a way that his flesh was of a little child. When you think of a child, you don't think that a child has usually rough, callous flesh. You don't think about that. A child usually has extremely smooth and soft skin. I can't help but imagine that right after he was healed of this leprosy, that his skin, it was so smooth that he probably would have felt or even looked like a young man once again. He was truly clean of this leprosy. Can't help but imagine that the flesh potentially might have just grew back immediately right after he washed his flesh. That, that would have been an amazing sight to see. Next we're going to look at point number 22. This is the folly of Gehazi. This is verses 15 through 27. This is probably the last point I'll get through this morning. Verse number 15 says, And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him. And he said, Behold, now I know that there is a... There is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now, for, now therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. But he said, As the Lord liveth before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Verse 17, And Naaman said, Shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant two mules burden of earth, for thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods but unto the Lord. In this thing the Lord pardoned thy servant, that when my master goeth into the house of Rimmon to worship there, he and he leaneth on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon. When I bow down myself in the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardoned thy servant in this thing. And he said unto him, Go in peace. So he departed from him a little way. Verse 20, But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master has spared Naaman this Syrian, in not receiving at his hand that which he brought. But as the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. Verse 21, So Gehazi followed after Naaman, and when Naaman saw him running, after him he lighted down from the chariot to meet him, and said, Is all well? Verse 22, And he said, All is well. My master hath sent me, saying, Behold now, or even now, there be come, from, come to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets, Give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of garments. And Naaman said, Be content, take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garments and laid them upon two of his servants, and they bare them before him. And when he came to the tower, he took them from their hand and bestowed them in the house, and he let the men go, and they departed. Verse 25, But he went in and stood before his master, and Elisha said unto him, Whence comest thou, Gehazi? And he said, Thy servant went no whither. And he said unto him, 
Went not my heart with thee. When the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee, is it a time to receive money and to receive garments and olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants and maid servants? The leprosy thereof, or therefore, of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence as a leper as white as snow. In verses 15 through 16, you have Naaman. He's trying to give this prophet a gift for the healing of his leprosy. I'm assuming that he's just trying to be a blessing back to this prophet because he healed him in a way that I don't believe had ever been done prior. We can look back in verse 5. We can see how he had all this gold. He had all this silver. He had all these changes of raiment. Yet you have a man of God. He refused to take any gift from this man. In verse number 17, we got to look how he makes a vow that no longer is he going to offer burnt offerings to any other God but the God of the Jews. Even though whenever he's under his king, whenever he bows down and he's with his king serving the God of Remen, I believe it is, or the house of Remen, which I believe to be uh, one of the false gods, he's wanting to be forgiven because he's going to be there at the presence with his king. He doesn't want to worship his master's false gods. He's worked forgiveness of those sins. He's In verse number 19, he's told to go in peace. He had the blessings of God on his life after he had been touched. He had wanted to turn his life and turn his heart around to actually serve God. Then we can look at verse number 20. He says, he knew that you have a Gehazi. He wasn't willing to take anything from Naaman. So he devises this plan that he was going to go and find Naaman and he's going to get some stuff. Because he knew that Naaman was wanting to be a blessing to him. He had all this gold. He had all this silver. He had all these things. And I can't help but imagine, he probably thought this was harmless. He probably thought, this isn't going to affect anybody. It's not going to hurt anybody. It's just going to be a blessing to help him. I believe verse number 22, I believe it is. It says, and he said... Is all well? And Gehazi, speaking right here, says, My master hath sent me, saying, Behold, even now there be come to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of garments. You have this man, he, Gehazi, he goes up with this idea that he's going to go get some stuff. He wanted a single piece of silver and two changes of clothing. Like I said, he probably thought it was harmless, but had he realized the consequences of what would actually happen, he would have rethought this. He probably would have regretted it so much that he would never even have considered doing this had he had known what the actual consequences would have been. But what I can tell, it almost looks like he's lying. He's claiming not just that Elijah had changed his mind about the gifts, but he's also claiming that there were sons of prophets that were on their way to come to them and these the silver and these changes of garments were for them we can look and I believe it's verse 24 says how he's talking to Gehazi he gets him to take an extra piece of silver so he gets two pieces of silver and he also gets changes of clothes verse 23 my bad it says and Naaman said be content take two talents and he urged him and bound two talents of silver into two bags with two changes of garments and laid them upon two of his servants and they bared them before him. Right there, he's, he's taking the stuff. After they get to the tower, you have Gehazi. He takes them, I'm assuming, into his room or in this house to, before he was to depart. And then in verse number 25, he goes and he gets into the presence of Elisha, or Elijah, or yeah, Elisha, I wrote it down wrong. And he gets called out. Essentially, he's like, at the very last sentence says, Thy servant went no whither. He was asked, Where'd you go? He said, I didn't go anywhere. I don't know if it was guilt or shame knowing exactly what he did. Probably a mix of the two. How he had, And he was called in verse 26 how he went to receive money and to receive garments. It also says something about olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants and maid servants. But I couldn't help but see in verse number 27, this is 
one of the harshest verses when you think about it. It says, The leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his, from his presence a leper as white as snow. We don't know how much leprosy actually covered his body. What we do know is he was white as snow. It was obvious that he was a leper. But I couldn't help but notice, though, the hard part, though, it wasn't just him that was getting this curse of leprosy. It was his children and his seed. It says, The leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. Even the children were going to have to bear the consequences of his actions forever by the way it's saying right here. Had he been able to go back, he probably never would have considered going back and taking the money, taking the <clears throat> garments that he had taken. I read in uh, Numbers 14, verse 18. It's a humbling verse when you think about it. It says, The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. This verse should come as a strong warning to all parents, to everybody, that the actions that were taken today have the potential to affect our children for generations. That's humbling when you really think about it. For better or for worse, whatever we're doing, it can and will affect our children. You have these generational curses. I know the pastors talked about it so many times. So many of these sins, such as the alcohol, drugs, fornication, and so many others that can literally go for generations over and over again, hurting the children for so long. Like I said, that should truly come as a warning whenever thinking through reading the Word of God, how the things that we do, how they can affect us sometimes for generations. It might be 50 years, 100 years, or even longer. Amen. We'll stop right there and uh, dismiss us in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I just want